Well, I'm sorry it's standing room only, but as John said, in the new Labour movement, it is standing room only. That is what, just in less than a year, the new Labour leadership have managed to achieve. I noticed on my way in that there's a film crew outside. You see it? A big film crew outside. Apparently, it's the uh, unannounced last and final episode of Line of Duty they're filming. Apparently, in this final episode of Line of Duty, we get to know what was the secret network that held it all together. What was the kind of organisation that could have linked all these sociopaths and crooks and playboys and organised criminals and tax dodgers and money launderers and inveterate liars and sheer incompetence. I'm not going to spoil it for you though. <laughs> but apparently the ringleader's dad had all his money in an offshore tax account. <laughs> When I voted for Jeremy Corbyn, I didn't think he would win. When I agreed to do this lecture, I actually thought Labour does have, you know, maybe three years of, you know, fairly ac academic debate uh, to work out what it is. As John said, you start from policy and you work from that to narrative. But I think I've been wrong there as well, because the Conservative government has turned into a shambles. Its budget doesn't add up. Its incompetence has put tens of thousands of steel jobs at risk. And then we had the Panama Papers. And that's even before we get to the night of the Brexit referendum. Because then it will be not so much the night of the long knives, but as the night of the Aspinall of London engraved Hallmark <coughs> sterling silver letter opening knife, priced <laughs> £125 plus VAT. Equally deadly. It's tempting to think, you know, let's just get the popcorn out and watch as they implode. But the Conservative fiasco, I think John and Labour and the front bench have to get serious about either an early election or a government that just is on the rocks so badly that suddenly all these journalists who've been working in my profession ignoring what you're doing turn around and say, oh, we'd better work out, we'd better find out what they are actually intending to do. And the state of the economy means, quite simply, and this is, you know, if you want to kind of tune out... Uh, and, and, and not listen for the rest of it, that what, what Labour needs to be thinking about is how to do a combined fiscal, monetary and industrial stimulus, not as a good idea if we win, but as an imperative for now. Something the opposition parties are prepared to unite around, spell out and force Cameron and Osborne to do because it's going to be necessary. With global growth this year set to be the lowest since Lehman Brothers went bust, we have to explain where the stagnation comes from that everybody's worried about and how it can be resolved in the interests of millions of ordinary people who right now, as they see it unfold, will feel powerless, depressed, poor and terrified about the future. So let me just talk about the source of the current slowdown. Because this sudden collapse into bickering and resignations and incompetence in Cameron's government is actually rooted in something real and economic. After eight years of a weak global recovery, driven largely by central banks creating money and buying government debt, this monetary stimulus, as we call it, is running out of steam. And the central bankers are more or less kind of turned into a jazz hands chorus uh, of panic signals in the last few months. Mark Carney in Shanghai in March quotes, the global economy risks becoming trapped in a low growth, low inflation, low interest rate equilibrium. Claudio Borio, chief economist for the Bank for International Settlements. Debt's too high, productivity's too low, policy room for manoeuvre too limited. Quote, unquote, we can't do anything. We need to abandon the debt fueled growth model, says Claudio. Mario Draghi, boss of the ECB, warns Europe of, quote, unquote, disastrous deflation unless the second round of quantitative easing he's trying to do kicks in. The central banks have, have turned base rates all over the world, especially in Europe and Japan, negative. So that means you put, nine, you put a pound in, you get 99p back before any economic factors have kicked in whatsoever. And now the central banks are openly contemplating what we call helicopter money drops, literally putting 10k into everybody's bank account uh, or buying not just the debts of companies, but their <coughs> shares as well. 
Now, Mark Carney, the boss of the Bank of England, is right to say there is probably one more round of monetary stimulus central banks can do, but after that, he said in Shanghai, it's over to policymakers to enact the radical structural reforms they've refused to do. He's right. All well and good. The problem is, the structural reform they prescribed is the medicine that's killing the patient. More austerity, more wage cuts, more welfare cuts, more laws that let firms like Uber destroy the established taxi services of a city, more chunks of the NHS handed to their friends in the private sector, later retirement ages, higher student debt, more contracts like the junior doctor's contracts, more freelancers in the public sector mysteri mysteriously being paid from accounts in the Isle of Man. That is what Mark Carney means and his predecessor, uh, Mervyn King, means by structural reform. That's what the IMF and the G20 are discussing right now. We'll keep, it, we'll keep the patient alive, guys, um, while you do the following things. But it doesn't work. And that's the secret behind Ian Duncan Smith's resignation. Even the Conservatives can go no further with their chosen form of austerity, which is to attack sick, disabled, working, the, the disabled, the working mum, the family whose council house is suddenly deemed too big. It doesn't work and they can't do it anymore. And that's why George Osborne's budget, and you imagine my, some of my <coughs> former colleagues in the BBC and even ITN would be running around screaming blue murder, John, if you presented a, an alternative budget with four and a half billion missing from it. But George Osborne, uh, nobody mentions it. Laura Kunzberg is not right now tweeting, you can be guaranteed, <laughs> about George Osborne's missing, uh, missing 4.5 billion. So in the face of this, Labour's diagnosis can be really simple, really clear, and really bold. We got here to 2008 and beyond because we built a free market economy where wages stagnate, where all the growth has to come from people borrowing against their house, on their credit card, on their car, or to go to college. It is as simple as that. When wages stagnate, growth has to be driven by credit, and credit can't sustain growth forever, and you get boom and bust. And boom and bust is not some kind of a uh, kind of gyroscope that simply keeps, go keeps on going. Every time you get boom and bust, something is destroyed. The dot-com crash of 1999 to 2001 destroyed most of the company pension system. Try getting into the company pension system after that. The subprime crash that ended in 2008 destroyed large parts of the welfare state and the pension systems across the world and has left us with, left us <coughs> with a debt pile that cannot be paid. The next crash will probably destroy parts of the private saving system. As anybody who any, any link with Cyprus knows, a bail-in to a bank, a bail-out is when the state saves it, a bail-in is when your savings are taken by the state. So that's no law across Europe, that's now permitted uh, since January the 1st this year. So boom and bust cycle is just not something that happens out there to finance. It's helped to suppress productivity. Again, the Bank for International Settlements has done good research on this. Misallocating, as we call it, capital on a vast scale. In a boom, thousands of undergraduates in Spain suddenly decide to become bricklayers because you will always earn more as a bricklayer than a, as a graduate. So forget your degree, move into the construction sector. That's what happened 10 years ago. Where are they now? 30% youth unemployment and a million unsold houses. That is what we mean by the misallocation of capital. And if you want a more concrete example, walk down any of these streets in Manchester, where it's coffee shops for graduates to work in, payday loan stores, employment agencies, what is it, Mustard High Street, 22 uh, outlets for alcohol. That's what we mean by misallocation of capital. And of course, round the corner, the food bank the Citizens Advice Bureau, to deal with people frantic over the state of their debts and their finances. And of course, while that describes what you might call the low end and the extreme end of what this economic model has done to communities like this, above it, of course, a layer of ordinary people, workers and middle class people, who have better pay, more secure work, their constant fear is of dropping into that world, and it acts as a kind of discipliner even if you've got a mortgage and a decent job, of course, who it is acts a discipline on your children because they have no chance of ever being as well off as you were. That's the story of how we got it. 
So how do we get out? There's no technocratic fix for everything. That was one of the problems of the Blair era. The, 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 this generation grew up that believed that if something goes wrong, you can always fix it. They're finding out now, starting with Iraq and Syria, that that isn't always the case, but it also applies in economics. But there are four headings we have to try to do something. Four headings. Fiscal policy, tax and spend. Industrial policy, how we shape the economy to encourage investment. Monetary policy and some radical and urgent structural reforms in the exact opposite direction to those dictated by people like Mark Carney and the IMF. Now John and his team were right, I think spectacularly right, to go early with Labour's version of the fiscal rule. It's intelligent, it's flexible, it's based on sound research, and what it would mean in practice, whether you can say this John, I can say it, because I'm just a journalist, it would mean that right now, Labour could cancel many of the spending cuts that Osborne is committed to. You could really just do that under the rule you've set yourself. Even Ed Balls' actual proposal going into the last election, late and misexplained though it was, would have allowed Ed Balls to have cancelled most of the second term cuts that Osborne wants and still meet all the fiscal targets that you set yourself. But my goodness, how, how well timed was your uh, position, John? Because right now, this week, this month, the demands for fiscal stimulus are coming from everywhere. From the IMF, which said last week, where fiscal space is available, fiscal stimulus should be implemented, focusing on boosting future productive capacity. That's your policy. The only problem is it's not the Conservatives' policy. It means where the country can afford to borrow more, it should cut taxes and boost spending on infrastructure, transport, skills, education, and the health of its population. That's what the IMF is telling developed world countries to do right now. The government's committed to doing the exact opposite. What it means, unless we can persuade them to do something different, is they're going to crash the UK economy because they're going to do what we call pro-cyclical policy. As the world economy slows down, they're going to slow the UK economy down some more. And why do we know that? It's because that's exactly what they called for Labour to do in 2008 when the first crisis hit. <clears throat> so let's be clear. Labour's fiscal policy, which would allow more borrowing now to fund longer term <coughs> spending, is exactly in tune with what the IMF, the economists of Ch Chatham House, who this week called for the G20 to, to launch a coordinated global fiscal stimulus. It is there in black and white, and I think Labour's policy agrees with it. On industrial policy, you're at the beginnings, because on industrial policy is not easy to do, especially if not, you haven't done it for 30 years. Mariana Mazzucato's work points that out. The work of economists based here in Manchester has pointed that out. When the answer isn't the free market, the answer, you can get it wrong. It's not easy to get. It's to say, it's a, you know, I think in the first years of doing industrial policy, it'll be a bit like tr you know, arriving at Old Trafford and saying, you know, this looks like an interesting thing to do. I'll have a go at playing premiership football. It, you're up against people who've been doing it their entire lives. Um, Mind you, you know, watching uh, the games at Old Trafford recently, <laughs> you sometimes wonder whether or not a happy amateur has been in charge there. But no, it's hard. But fiscal stimulus and the coordinated state direction of the private sector are not enough. The next phase of monetary stimulus will be critical. When the central bankers say we can't do much more, what they really mean is we can't do more of this raw printing of money. They know it could end up tearing the world economy apart because what it's leading to in already between Japan and China and Japan and the USA is competitive devaluations. So basically people printing more money in the hope that, they, that their currency will fall and that will stimulate their own growth. And everybody knows from the 1930s that once you're in that game, it's a negative sum game. It ends with everybody poorer. And what it's already doing is dragging everything close to zero. Low growth, low inflation, at, you know, and low interest rates. So I think it's time for Labour to, his, to address a historic weakness, but a major opportunity when it comes to monetary policy. In 1931, Labour government fell 
because it couldn't stomach the level of austerity needed to keep Britain in the, the, the 1930s equivalent of the euro, the gold standard. All currencies were pegged to each other, and if yours got out of kilter, you had to cut public spending to make it right. So Labour split. Ramsay MacDonald formed a national government with the Conservatives. I hope, maybe even, I'm really pleased if some of the young people who don't know this story, I hope all you do, the old uh, grey beards of Labour, because it's ingrained into our DNA, Labour split. The leadership of Labour formed a national government with the Tories, and then, why? To implement the austerity that Labour couldn't stomach. Fine, all going to script. And then, as a result of pay cuts demanded by the Treasury, the Royal Navy mutinied at Invergordon. There was an immediate run on the pound, forcing Britain to ditch the gold standard, devalue sterling, scrap the pay cuts to the Royal Navy, and scrap a substantial part of the austerity programme that Labour had fallen over. If the acronym WTF had been invented back then, <laughs> you can bet a lot of Labour MPs would have been tweeting it. As it was, one MP, Labour MP, who had stayed with the party, famously and simply said, we didn't know you could do that. We didn't know you could come off the gold standard. And from then until now, I think there has been this weakness in Labour's understanding of what a central bank and what monetary policy can do. And let's understand why. The whole experience of Labour as a party, of the unions and of the working class, makes the idea of messing around with the value of money and its supply seem esoteric. If you want to promote equality, you tax the rich and you redistribute wealth. If you know anything about economics, you'll know that a bloke called John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s said you advocate government spending to pump prime demand to get out of a depression. And that is true. So for, in the kind of labour mindset, everything points to fiscal policy being something useful, while monetary policy is neutral, technocratic, boring, esoteric, and, and didn't Ed Balls and, and, and Gordon Brown go out of their way to take it out of politics and make the Bank of England independent in 1997? Yes, they did. But in this, the third leg of the global crisis, monetary policy will be crucial. Monetary stimulus has kept global capitalism alive for eight years. But, as Bank of England Chief Economist Andrew Haldane points out, once you print trillions of dollars of money and start buying government debt, then you, ev you effectively dissolve the walls between fiscal and monetary policy. So even if you only want to do fiscal stimulus, you have to then understand what its monetary impact and its monetary amplifiers are going to be. <clears throat> so, even now, the Treasury gets an annual windfall from the profits it makes on the government bonds it holds. The Bank of England passes the money to the Treasury and George Osborne uses it to cut, to cut public spending some more. Uh, it's treated as accidental. And of course, if the Bank of England holds all the bonds it's, it's bought until maturity, and that is its unannounced policy, to hold them for 30, 20 or 30 years, it makes it much cheaper for the government to borrow in future. Again, treated as a happy accident. Because in the orthodox thinking of neoliberalism, central banking is supposed to be independent of the treasury and doesn't have any, even in Europe, it's even illegal for the central bank to think about financing the state in this way. But if we need another round of quantitative easing, and I suspect we will, then the, these positive spillovers from what you do with money to the tax and spending world are, are going to be overt. And not just from the central bank to the treasury, but from the central bank to individual businesses, commercial banks, and consumers. Look at what the ECB is doing. The ECB, you know, having done nothing for five years, finally in a panic, realizing the onrushing stagnation that is coming at them, starts buying everything. So they're now buying the debt of companies. Well, you know, if you buy, if you buy Volkswagen's debt, you are part nationalizing its risk. That's what the ECB is doing. If you buy government debts on a scale that the cost of borrowing for government turns negative, so think about it, the government gets money for, you know, in, in the sense that if a bank wants to park its money overnight, then the central bank, which is only an arm of the government, earns money from that. If you buy company shares or simply pour money into people's bank accounts, what you're doing is directly supporting parts of the economy. And this is what the ECB is already doing. It's what the Japanese central bank is already doing. I think Labour's starting point should be 
to stave off deflation, you do what it takes. You do whatever it takes in terms of monetary and fiscal stimulus. This is what I think, you know, in the next two to three years, we may have to talk about. But this time, the next round of monetary policy, especially if it might have to be the last, if there's no more you can do, will have to be done in synergy with fiscal policy, with fiscal stimulus, to do all the things neoliberal governments don't want to do to boost wages, to boost investment, to boost welfare provision, and to boost the social wage, and to boost people's acquisition of skills. To make this happen, I think we need to do a big change in mindset. It's all very well having an independent central bank, and we should keep it. But when monetary policy supports specific parts of the private sector, when it's being used specifically to finance the state, then whatever the instruments the bank buys, whatever kind of debt or equity or loans it buys, the policy must be under the control of a democratically elected politician. And that's a big thing. Um, I'm sure that will be the headline, of, if anybody's listening, of what I say tonight. Because central banks can do things at will that, as we found out with our hapless Labour MP, nobody knows you can do. In Britain, for example, you could print 70 billion worth of money and buy not government debt, but student loans. You could buy all the student loans, that's over the 64 billion outstanding student loans in Britain. And what could you do? You could hold them to maturity, as they plan to do with, so that's the lifetime of the loan. And you could, because this is on the agenda of central banks all over the world, give a repayment holiday lasting 30 years to everybody who's got a student loan. They've taken a risk, they've gone to college, they've borrowed money, you know, at risk to themselves, and uh, the reward would be the sudden disappearance of that line on your paycheck that says student loan repayment. Didn't know you could do that? Well, you do now, because if you control the central bank democratically, you can do quite a lot of things you don't know you can do. Labour's got to have the policy to the courage, rather, to adopt an active monetary policy. I think it's got to urge the government to do so. In fact, Richard Murphy, one of John's advisors, has actually said that the danger at the moment is that the government does it before you even think about it, it's going to do it, if, if things get as bad as they might. Of course, you can't do it off the cuff. You've got to be able to have the expertise to do it. But above all, because the institutions Labour set up in 1997, which were the right institutions then, that was the way capitalism was going, away from ministers setting interest rates to technocrats setting interest rates, those institutions set up then are inadequate now for controlling the kind of thing that needs to happen. I think Labour should keep the central bank independent, but it should set a tighter remit for the governor. The MPC as a body can only manage the economy to a, to a single target if that economy is stable and not in crisis. In a period of high volatility and unorthodox policy, the target alone is just inadequate for guiding action. It's like, say, I, go to the, I went to the quarterly press conferences of the Bank of England and to hear them justify either doing nothing or doing nothing or doing nothing, because all they've done is nothing for five years, um, through trying to adhere to one target. It's like, say, if your car is veering off the road and there's a cliff approaching and, a, and, a, and an antelope leaping out in front of you and your child is in the back in, uh, trying to grab the, the, the steering wheel, the rule, I must be in the middle lane at 70 miles an hour, is not particularly relevant for what you have to do. But that is like being a member of the MPC. They've only got one rule, I must be in the middle lane going at 70. In, in other words, they do things but in other words, they do them without any accountability or indeed transparency. Amid near de deflation with a consistent 2% undershoot of the inflation target, the Bank of England is saying, right now, we can't do any more because if, all right, inflation's nearly zero, it's meant to be 2% or between 2 and 4%, that's the symmetrical target, and it's nearly zero. The bank says, we can't do anything because if we did, there'd be a risk that inflation would go over 2 to 4 percent. Okay, well, there's an answer to that. As proposed, not by some radical revolutionary Marxist, that George Osborne, you know, is, seems to be worried about, but uh, Nick Kunis, an analyst at ABN Ambro, or John Hopkins Professor, uh, Johns Hopkins University Professor Lawrence Ball, among many who've proposed across the world, you raise the inflation target to 4 percent. 
then there's no danger of overshooting it because you've got between zero and four. If you think between zero and four is a, medium, is a small number, well, you know, if you have 0.25% inflation and it goes up to 5%, that's double. 0.5, that's double. We're not talking here about tiny points. It's a massive, massive uh, uh, buffer for policymakers to operate in too. So a 4% target, what would it do now? It would force the Bank of England to take stimulus measures immediately and ones that spilled directly over into benign effects on government finances, company finances, commercial bank finances, and your finances. The bank's experts would, of course, offer the government of the day a range of things to do to meet that 4%. But once you're into picking and choosing what you buy, as I say, or which people you help, it's got to be a political decision. That's the inadequacy of the current setup. So I'm against helicopter money. I'm against giving everybody 10K. I'm in favour of people's QE, as originally outlined by Richard Murphy, which is the, 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 the allocation of specific piles of debt to specific projects. Bank of England buys them, sinks them for 30 years. All these things are being discussed. Every person in the city you meet, discuss them. When is QE, when is helicopter money coming? When's Osborne going to do it? The only problem is we don't get a say in it. And yet it's a more powerful policy, if you think about it, 325 375, I'm sorry, billion pounds invented and spent is a much bigger policy action than any fiscal policy could ever be. We've got no control over it. And that's why we need it. And we, do, we need to get away from the mystery play that is the quarterly inflation report of the Bank of England. Now, what would the economy do, what would the world markets do, to an outburst of monetary stimulus done this way by a radical left government, not by one of the good old boys of the G20 uh, radical right government. Well, it depends what the other central banks do. If nobody else does it, the sterling will fall. Okay, so the pound will devalue. That's bad if you're an importer, good if you're an exporter. Uh, the whole point is, of course, to turn us into a more export-oriented economy. And the USA used the falling value of the dollar for five years after the 2008 crisis exactly in this way as an unannounced form of competition against China. Okay, So it's not, it's not without its problems, but it's not a problem if you manage it right. Of course, you would also get a lot of rhetoric, as Gordon Brown faced in 2008, about a bond market strike. That if you do this, if you start taking control of monetary policy, it's against the rules of the club, guys, and we're going to not buy any more of your bonds. And we'll bet that you're going to default. Well, the only good thing Mario Draghi has done, actually, as boss of the ECB, is to, as he said, commit to doing whatever it takes to make sure anybody in the market who bets on the central bank failing in its policy will lose their shirt. You can do it. Didn't know you could do that? You can. Uh, and Labour should, in the face of any bond market vigilante brigade, you go, you know, right, we'll do what Draghi did. We will make sure that you lose your money if you try and outguess this government. Now, you might be thinking, Paul, why risk, given every, even everybody thinks we're revolutionary Trotskyists anyway, why risk <laughs> a foray into a policy area that's been depoliticised? Why not stick to our knitting and do and if, just a fiscal policy? That was an argument put in the, against the original People's QE policy by one of John's advisors, Simon Ren Lewis. My argument is fiscal policy has its limits unless supported by monetary expansion. This is something Keynes recognised in the early 30s. Um, that you know you can't. You know, Keynes said, "Look, you, you, even if you turn the American economy into a Soviet-style state-owned economy with lots of workshops, people digging holes and filling them in again. But sooner or later, that reaches its limits. And Keynes said, you shoot your bolt, as, as he put it. You need the monetary side to be working for you. And I think as well, we are heavily in debt. And I think it is important for people who are on the labor side of politics to understand fiscal policy can't do anything. Can't do everything, rather. So fiscal stimulus is a tax cut. It's not a tax rise, it's a cut to help co companies grow. In a city like Manchester, an area like the more northwest, you might, in a crisis, have to cut their taxes. So you see the problem. Right. Now, to cut to the chase, because I can feel like I'm kind of almost kind of nobbling me right now, I want to end with a consideration I hope is in front of uh, the leadership's mind and your minds as potential 
Labour voters and Labour supporters, and hopefully for the young people, participants in this economic work we all need to do. What can economics deliver? I think what's happened inside Labour is a symptom of something worldwide. It's an understanding, and among an entire generation, that free market capitalism is broken that they are the victims, that they will be poorer than their parents, that mainstream politics has been captured by a hereditary elite. Economic policy in this situation has to be, first of all, demonstrative. It must show that generation that you are serious, that you are serious and determined to break with the old model. You might fail, but this is what Varoufakis did. Varoufakis was not a great politician, is not. But, but he did the demonstrative break. Because people in the city of London said, Syriza, well, he, he looks good. He must be just like Tony Blair. You know, they, they, they're just going to do the same old thing. You have to make the break. You have to do things that immediately deliver. The student loan example I gave is just one. We just need a, a team of experts to work out what you could do, what you can do, and what you will do, and we offer it to people. What could it do for the north of England? Let's be clear about the essential deal the Conservatives have offered the north of England. Obey our economic di diktats, help us destroy the NHS through privatisation, marketise all your local services, and you can have a semblance of local control and a nice slogan. And some people have fallen for it. But for all the talk, most of the infrastructure money is going to the south, and they were prepared to let steel die, red cars closed, Scunthorpe sold off, and when Chorley closed its A&E department, I strongly suspect that before Jeremy Hunt asked why, he had to ask, where is Chorley? <laughs> <laughs> if you think that's bad now, another thing is coming. A bigger shock. Either through independence or through a much more radical form of home rule, which is a proposal gaining ground inside the Scottish Labour Party, Scotland, I think, will govern its fiscal affairs. It'll control its own tax system. Sooner or later, it'll try and play the same game as all of the small nations play of competition for inward investment. And that will put North of England geographically trapped between Ireland with its low tax regime and high offshore propensities, and Scotland, even in fairly competing for growth, still competing. For Labour to govern Britain, our grandfathers knew there always had to be an alliance. The Scottish working class, the Welsh working class, here, the industrial areas of the north, and the urban working class of the large cities, including London. Today, I think we've got to construct a new alliance. We've got to talk to the young city dweller. You know, it becomes clear to them what a Labour vote gets you. A mayor or a council would be more likely to represent you, the hard-pressed renter and commuter, than the interests of property developers and landlords and private railway companies. <coughs> to people in Scotland and Wales, I think Labour will have to offer a much more radical form of fiscal independence. Incidentally, a, a, a democratically controlled central bank <coughs> would be a very good lever to, to offset what was happening fiscally between four separate regimes inside the UK. <coughs> But what about the north of England? Three times the population of Scotland, no popular cultural renaissance like in Scotland, no cohesive professional class clustered around a separate legal system, separate education system, separate health system, no version of the BBC, uh, no six o'clock news for the north of England to tell its side of the story, no special TV programmes to support our language, unless you go to <laughs> Coronation Street and Emmerdale. <laughs> And at times, we're not even sure what our story is. North of England is a massive dose of all the things only a Labour government can offer. Fiscal stimulus focused on infrastructure and skills. So you don't get firms saying, you know, but for a one-year gap between a PhD-level uh, you know, engineer and the work that person needs to do, they are driving taxis. That's a real situation going on in this city right now. Firms that cannot recruit because the, the missing bit of the training and education will not be paid for by the private sector and government hasn't got the money. Well, with our policies, you could find the money. State intervention to save industries in terms the Conservatives have never heard of. Labour market reforms, the opposite of what the IMF dictates, to boost unionisation, boost pay and boost job security. And monetary policies, again, specifically designed to synthesise with all the rest. I think if Labour does this, it may have to combine, it may have to do even fit specific fiscal measures designed to boost the competitiveness and attractiveness of Northern England. 
to global investment. A reminder, in case anybody on John's team needs to remind him, that sometimes it can be left-wing to cut taxes for business. Because it's simply about making sure that the people we need to have good jobs, permanent and stable jobs, have them in globally recognised companies, not the local barista at fraternity. Whether with borrowed money or printed money, you can build all the ports and high-speed rail tracks and tram systems you need, but you actually need businesses to provide the high-value work that goes between them, without which they are just simply you know, going to be left high and dry. And let's be honest about the private sector in the north. It's good. It's brilliant at times. And I could take you to work within five miles of here. World-class aircraft design companies, cutting-edge research labs in materials and pharmaceuticals, small tech startups spun off in textbook manner from universities. It's all there, but it's too small. And it's too small because there's not enough money in the economy. So what we need in the north of England is at least one regional investment bank, an integrated transport plan, a comprehensive industrial policy, universities mandated to practice collaborative competition on a regional scale, and massive, massive investment in skills. Whichever member of the Bullingdon Club is chosen to replace Cameron, all they can offer the North is more closed A&Es, few, a few late road and rail routes, benign neglect as to whether steel is produced in Scunthorpe or Shenzhen, and a shoddy Priyar slogan. And it might be that Scottish people do decide their safest route out of a Britain run for the rich is to leave. Now, when you see John and Jeremy vilified as threats to national security, you know, they, you can't blame sometimes people saying this is a country that will never, ever break its habit of voting for rich, elite, hereditary uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> But the North of England doesn't have that option. North's only option is the one our grandfathers designed in the pits, in the furnaces, in the spinning mills, in the railway sheds, uh, whose ruins litter our landscape. That's, you know, unlike Scotland, we only have one answer, and it is the Labour Party. The North of England needs the Labour Party to be left-wing, radical, and brave. Thank you.